Warning, the Stone Age Gamer includes a lot of bad language. Cover your mother ears. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to episode 127 of the Stone Age Gamer podcast for the week of November 25th, 2016. I am Chris Randazzo and returning with me today is mythical bird, Dan Ryan. Good evening, everyone. And tonight we are joined by a very special guest, author of Phoenix 4, the history of video, the video game industry, Mr. Leonard Herman. Hello there. Lenny is going to talk to us about video games, and we cannot wait to get that all started. But before we do, here's your weekly reminder that you can email us at mail at geekade.com. Let us know what you think of our show, what topics you would like us to discuss in the future, or just say hello, because we always want to hear from you, the listener. So, Lenny, yeah. how are you? I'm doing swell, thank you. Um, uh, and Dan, how are you? I, much better this week. I'm glad. Yes. It's been a rough. It's been a rough week for us all. So, um, all right. Lenny here wrote. Uh, he wrote one of my my favorite books. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I spent a lot of time reading about the uh, the history of video games. And the first book that I ever read uh, about the subject was uh, Steve Kent's Ultimate History of Video Games. And after I finished that book, I started looking around and getting suggestions on. Uh, what the what what the next book I should read because I wanted to know more I wanted to, more in depth stuff, and the two books that kept coming up were Game Over by David Sheff and Phoenix: The Fall and Rise of Video Games by Leonard Herman. Uh, and at the time, I believe both of them were out of print in one way or another. Uh, but this was, let me see this. I have my I'm holding my copy of Phoenix Three in my hands right now, and this was. Um, this must have been. This is it the big one or the little one? It's the it's relatively well compared to Phoenix Four. It's pretty small. Um, no, it's the size is eight and a half by eleven, or was it small seven by ten? Or six by nine, I think. Hmm. I'm getting a ruler. <laughs> Let's see here. <laughs> we are gonna. Um, we are nothing if not technically accurate on. It the was the blue cover, though. Yes, yeah, the blue cover. Um, was- I bought it from you personally at PAX. I, uh, I was at PAX okay. East, and um, let's see. I walked into like an arcade room, and there you were selling there. this, this right. books, and I was like, "Holy crap! That's the that's the book that I'm looking for." Yeah, it's six by nine. Okay, so that was after 2005. That was the that was a subsequent printing after it was out of print for a while. All right. That's right. I feel like I remember talking to you about that at yeah, the. After I realized that Phoenix Four wasn't coming out too soon, I decided to <laughs> reprint it in a smaller size. Uh, you wrote to Chris, best wishes, and uh, you signed it. And I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, and and I took this thing home and I read the ever loving garbage out of it, like as as quickly as I could, and uh, I I really liked it, but. Let me just say that when I got Phoenix Four in the mail, <laughs> which I am now holding in my other hand, I was astonished. This thing is at least twice the size of Phoenix Three. Like, I was not expecting this giant tome, and it is wonderful. Like, the first thing uh, I w- in in the introduction to your book, you talked about. Um, uh, how you used to call it, it was called Phoenix because it was largely about how the industry came back from the big crash and the industry has come so far since then you would kind of wrestled with whether or not it should still be, even be called Phoenix and uh, the, 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 the meaning of that. And when I, just looking at this book and compared to the previous version, I would say that it definitely at least physically deserves to be called Phoenix because it is, just from a purely physical presentation standpoint, it just completely blows away uh, your your previous edition. Like, be very proud of this. This is a very, very nice looking book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was in negotiations with a publisher, and they're the ones who brought the subject of changing the name. And I said, well, it can't. Be, the name has to stay as Phoenix, but we'll change the, uh, the subtitle. Mm-hmm. And like you said, as the inter- introduction says, it tells the story of how, why, how, and why it got changed. Mm-hmm. 
And it really got me excited to to reread the book. I, I finished reading those, both the introductions. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm ready. Ah, crap. I have to be at work in like four hours. I should probably go to sleep. <laughs> I should probably sleep at some point, you know. So, so um, just, just generally for our listeners, in case they don't really know of this book, give us a, a breakdown. What What is your definition of what this book is? It's the history of the video game industry. <laughs> <laughs> Back in back in uh, 1987, when I started writing it, there were no definitive history of video games. Mm -hmm. uh, there were magazines like Kunkel had a ma had an article in uh, Analog Magazine, a three part series, the history of games. There were earlier books from the 80s like uh, Video Invaders that had some chapters on history, but nothing mm -hmm. was a complete history book. Mm -hmm. But uh, originally, I started writing a book called ABC to the BCS, which was a, a directory to all the games that were available for the Atari 2600. Hmm. But after the crash, that book, uh, there was no need for that book anymore. <laughs> Not so, a lot of demand for that, huh? So I was trying to think, well, what can I write? And then, so how about a history book? <laughs> one doesn't exist, so why not write one? Because I had all the notes and stuff around. Mm -hmm. So I just started writing it. Oh, well, I'm glad you did. <laughs> was the uh, was your plan always? Because like, what what kind of strikes me about this book versus other ones um, is that you you take the history of of the industry and kind of tell it more as a story rather than just straight factual information. Like it's not bullet point to bullet point. There's there's a story kind of woven through here. Was well, that one section segues. I try to make it segue into a, into another section, and that was that was totally intentional. Like from the get go, was I want to tell this as a story, or well, I, mean, I don't know if you could really call it a story. Uh, it is one fact after another. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, but I mean, like, I don't know. It doesn't read like a history book. You know what I mean? Like if I if I read my history book in school, I don't get the same vibe from this. I get there's. But that's because like a, this is might be because this is a subject you're interested in. Well, that that's a very <laughs> fair point, sir. <laughs> yeah, I would I, I would definitely say that um, as far as far as it being a, it, it's kind of difficult for me to, to to describe the the reading of this book, just because I am so just completely and totally fascinated with the subject matter. Um, I would say that there's like a, I didn't really get much of a specific narrative storytelling vibe from it i i did kind of feel it was a bit more intentionally you know piece to piece like this goes here and this goes there whereas like other books like um i'm most of the way through i, I believe it's called replay by a guy named tristan donovan mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's each chapter is a different subject there was that in that book each chapter covers a different subject yeah yeah and and he seemed i i <sighs> it's been so long since I actually started that book. I feel like I remember him saying like towards the, the beginning of it, that he wanted to try to weave that as more of a, a narrative tale. And um, I don't know. I, I kind of prefer this, this route of, of Phoenix because it's like, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's reading this book just made me feel like I was learning something. Like I really, really felt like I was learning things uh, piece by piece, even when I was very confused by it. Like, uh, after I read Phoenix three, I wrote a review of it way back in the, the, the old times when I used to write for the examiner, uh, which, I saw, which that's how I found you <laughs> in, indeed. Uh, and, and put a, a quote from it on your book, which, uh, is really, really one of the highlights of my, uh, my, uh, professional career, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, but one of the things I, I noticed when I was reading the book is that I, I would get lost an awful lot because you're you mentioned so many of the technical aspects, which I is fascinating to me. Um, and I just, it makes me, it made me want to learn more about that kind of stuff. Like I remember you describing uh, the older consoles, like just the, the pieces that went into them and like why they were significant. And uh, I didn't get a lot of that out of uh, the other books that I've read on the subject and uh, really Really, it, it was it was very interesting to me that that was the that that was the case, and that it managed to stay so interesting to me as I read the whole thing. Because I, you know, I I'm not much of a reader. Uh, okay. It's it's <laughs> never been my thing. Well, um, let me let me go. Uh, just tell you a little story. My wife's uh, aunt was a guidance teacher in uh, New York City, 
a guidance counselor in New York City, and she had a student who just wouldn't read. So she gave him a copy of Phoenix One, and he read it from cover to cover. It was like the first time he read a book. Wow. That probably would have worked for me too. Um, <laughs> honestly, like uh, Ultimate History of Video Games is one of the first books I've ever leisurely read. Like on my own, I I couldn't put that book down. Mm-hmm. And, and and as much as I love uh, you know, books about the history of this industry, I, I've I've been working on Tristan Donovan's book for like a year and change. And it's not because it's bad. It's just that I'm not. I'm not much of a reader. Um, I think the only other books I, ever... I, I read that book and I, I had a hard time getting through it. Okay. That makes me feel better <laughs> because <laughs> I thought maybe it was just me. Um, cause it, it, I almost feel like when it's on, it's on. And when it's, when it wasn't, it, it's, I don't know, the book does not, it doesn't grab me the way that yours would. I remember actually reading a good chunk of yours on the beach, uh, in ocean city, uh, during the summer, I would just bring Not this the out there. Not the weekend I was there, though. What was that? Not the weekend I was there. No, no. <laughs> no, this was this was a while ago. Oh, I know. Who knows? Maybe you were there. We didn't really know each other We've at been that. Going there for eighteen years. Yeah, it's entirely possible that we were <laughs> in the same place at the same time. But uh, I was riveted by this book, and it's and I think it's just because you can tell that you know, you were there for so much of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, that comes through so much in the writing. And I mean, I don't mean this to just like sound like a whole bunch of, you know, I love this man. I want to tell you all how much I, I love your book over and over again. I mean, I really okay, want to listen. Do to that. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I well, want anybody who's listening to kind of a to really this. terrible podcast if we were like, so this guy wrote a book. It's garbage. <laughs> oh, God. Let's trash him for like quick. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know. But I, I really want anyone listening to this to know that this this book is written with absolute love and care. And like, for example, I remember picking up the this this third edition and looking at the cover and you you mentioned yourself in Phoenix War that you're not a graphic designer. And oh, huh? this thing looks <laughs> homemade as heck. But the words forward by Ralph Baer, father of video games, are on the cover. And that like. And my, to my mind, that lends it all the credence it needs. Uh, and it's it's a fascinating read because uh, Bear, Ralph Bear was a was a fascinating man. Uh, I only got to meet him once uh, and he was just the the most pleasant person oh. imaginable. Uh, he uh, I met him at the Philly Classic Gaming mm-hmm. Expo. He was just standing at a table and nobody was talking to him. Really? I re- really he was just standing there. And I remember. But we were there, me, Bill Kunkel, Ralph, uh, Michael Thomason. I Yeah, he was by himself. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it was everybody else was on lunch, but he was just standing there. And I remember <laughs> Ralph, I walked past him and I recognized him because I'd seen a picture of him before. I was like, holy crap, that's Ralph Bear. And I talked well, to I, him. I did the minutes. same thing the first time I met him in 1983 at, uh, at uh, CES. Wow! Saw, and for me to get into CES the first time I ever went, I had to get a retailer badge to get in. Mm-hmm. And I saw him and I said, I went up, I go, you're Ralph Bear. And he looks at me and goes, so? <laughs> <laughs> and I just <laughs> quietly went away with my t- tail between my legs. <laughs> but years later, his wife, I told his wife that story and she said, that's the way he is. He, he didn't consider himself a big shot. That was exactly the way he was with me. I mean, I, I, I said, I said, excuse me, are you Ralph Bear? And he said, yeah. And I was like, thank you for, for thanks for inventing this stuff. And then I, I asked like, I, for my whole you, life. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Thanks for inventing my existence. But, uh, I chatted with him just like shot the breeze with him for a few minutes. And then I, I asked him to hold on for a minute. I went to a, a table across the hall and I bought, um, an odyssey, I think it's a, a honestly like 300 or something. And I brought it over to him, asked him to sign it. <laughs> and he was like, wow, I haven't seen one of these in a long time. And he autographed it for me and it's hang, it's sitting in my living room. It's one of my favorite things that I own. Uh, Cause well, well, one of my closest friends got a, a original odyssey when it first came out in 1972. So uh, uh, several years ago I brought, he still has it. Mm-hmm. So I brought it up with me to visit Ralph and Ralph signed it for him. 
So he still has his original Odyssey now with Ralph Bear's autograph on it. Wow. I've always wanted an original Odyssey. I've never been able to afford one, actually. They're, they're pretty expensive as far as, you know, those kinds of collector's items go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on my list. I, was... want, I want it to be different, though. I had Ralph sign my sign my Simon. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's that's another thing that I, I at the time when I met him, I didn't know like a bunch of the other things that he had invented. And I was a huge fan of Simon. And when I found out he invented that and what is it in your the new book, you mentioned that he invented the like talking greeting cards or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow, man, this guy is just just incredible. So well, what he, he asked me to do uh, before he died. At, I don't know if you've been to the Smithsonian and saw his exhibit. Mm -mm, no. A monitor showing, you know, the video ping pong. And he wanted me to do a montage that interspersed with the pong. I mean, I shouldn't say it. I, oh, I'll bite my tongue. <laughs> interspersed with the video ping pong showing all the other things that he invented. But I needed high quality, uh, high resolution photos. Mm -hmm. And and unfortunately, I didn't take it home with me that day. And then when I got back. He was just too sick to supply it, so we never did it. Oh, so now all sad. <laughs> <laughs> what was um? So you you said you you've known Ralph for a long time. Uh, what was what was your what was it like knowing the guy? Like, would, did you guys do any going on crazy fun adventures or anything? Did you ever slay a dragon or anything like that? I mean, what was your I, relationship I, with? I, I, loved like? him. I, I I was just amazed by him. I was in awe, total awe. I mean, I go to his house. We'd sit in his office and he'd show me what he's working because he's always working on stuff. He tried. You there? Yeah, yeah. Not because my screen went blank. He uh, he tried to teach me electronics, which I just couldn't get, <laughs> get the idea of. <laughs> but he was just an incredible guy. He was so with it. You wouldn't, you know, he, when you're with him, you don't think you're with a 90 year old guy. Hmm. It was just so incredible. And I always refer to him as my uh, my surrogate father. Mm -hmm. And I miss him. I still miss him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I never really felt like the guy got enough credit. I mean, it's it's there. It, it, obviously, I believe like names like Shigeru Miyamoto deserve to be mm -hmm. you know, household names. And hey, it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Shigeru Miyamoto. <laughs> um, but I was always kind of fascinated by the fact that this guy wasn't like back to my story about when I first met him at the, the Philly classic, it was amazing to me that I walked past him and he was just standing there by himself. Like how was there not a crowd of people around him um, at any sort of gaming situation? How could there not just be a ton of people just standing around him, asking him what he's doing and thanking him. And that's, <laughs> has always been just, just very bizarre to me that, that he just never he never seemed to get that household name status. And I mean, clearly he didn't feel like he deserved it because you know, you said he was always a very humble guy and didn't really think much, much, much of himself as a celebrity, but I mean, well, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I will. <laughs> uh, when he first invited me to his house, what happened was uh, when Phoenix one came out, he sent me a letter asking how can he get a copy? So I said, well, this is Ralph Bear. I'm sending him a copy. And then when Phoenix 2 came out, I said, well, I'm going to send him a copy. And I sent him a copy. He never responded. I said, what's with this guy? First, he <laughs> you know, doesn't want to talk to me at CES. And now he doesn't respond when I send him a book. But what happened was he had he was down in his winter home in Florida when I sent the book out. And I sent it to Manchester. And he didn't get it till the spring. And then that spring, I guess it was 1998, he invited me up to his house. Oh, wow. So uh, when I told, because I was writing for Electronic Gaming Monthly, I told them about it. They said, oh, you got to write an article about him. So I wrote this article, The Bear and Said Shoals. Uh, I remember that article. And uh, I mean, even the editors at uh, EGM, they said it was like one of the best articles that they ever published. And Ralph told me he credited it that for his newfound fame. Because <laughs> it was after that article that people in the industry got reacquainted with him that a lot of people who never heard of him learned about him through that. I think that's, I think that's actually how I learned about him was there. Cause I was a big EGM reader back then. So I'm proud of that. 
Well, thank you. <laughs> that, that's that's a connection I never really thought about before. Was how did I learn about Ralph Bear? And I remember you talking about. I remember when you talked mentioned that article. I remember reading that back back then. So yeah, I guess that that must have been how I learned about him. So well, thank you for that. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm I'm kind of mixing up some of my questions here, but uh, just kind of on a similar topic before we go to our break. Um, what uh what parts of what part of video game history or people in video game history, with the exception of uh, Ralph Baer, do you feel are most overlooked? And are there any other people that you think need to be talked about more or to, you know, just pieces of history that don't get the credit that they deserve? Yeah, well, another person who I wrote an article about before anyone else did was Ted Dabney, who co-founded Atari. Mm-hmm. And Bush uh, Bushnell is like the name that everyone knows. Like yeah, he's... well, Bushnell has been telling his story for thirty years, mm-hmm. and and the story changes from one day to the next. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, when I wrote, I wrote an article about Ted, Ted Dabney that was published in Edge magazine. Uh, I guess around two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and this was the first time Ted ever told his side of the story in thirty five years or so. And yeah, since then, he's been getting, you know, he's been invited to the computer, I think the Computer History Museum to give a, an oral history. And, uh, but he's, he's totally overlooked. Even today, people mention Atari, they're always, or people mention Nolan Bush, and they're always going to say Atari founder, not Atari co-founder. Hmm. You would never say uh, Steve Jobs, founder of Apple. You would always say the co-founder. Yeah. But in the case of Atari... Ted's always neglected. And he's a great guy. He's been, uh, I thought I read somewhere that his house was flooded or something recently. Oh, no, no, his house burnt down. Oh, geez. Someone st- he lives out uh, outside of San Francisco, and there was a wildfire that had been set, and it just completely engulfed his house. Oh, man. So I just talked to him last week. Uh, they're renting a house now. Uh, he still doesn't have internet, so we can't talk that frequent yet. And he's just waiting for the insurance to come through to see what he can afford to rebuild. <clears throat> but he lost all his notes and stuff. He's really upset about that. And we tell him that the gaming industry would be more than happy to do a GoFundMe to help him out. But at this point, he doesn't want help yet. Oh. What a guy. It's a shame because, you know, you, you look at somebody who is given – so much but been largely ignored finds themselves in a situation where they're down on their luck and people would love to help yeah we told him that but he does he he doesn't want to help yet he might come return and say uh yeah yeah, i do need help and in that case me marty goldberg and kurt vendell were all ready to pitch in well if that thing goes live you tell us about it we'll (laughs) we'll promote it to heck too uh, what what's a uh, what else can you tell us about um I mean, besides co-founding Atari what's a uh, what's Ted Dabney been up to with his career? Well, he's retired. I've ne- actually I've never met him personally. We've only talked on the phone and on Skype and emails. Uh, I mean, he's invited me out there, but like I said he's out in California. I'm in New Jersey, so it's a little tough. Not the easiest trek in the world. <laughs> uh, he left Atari because he couldn't. Stan working with Nolan Bush now. <laughs> we had Nolan buy him out. Then he, uh, when Nolan started uh, Pizza Time Theater, mm-hmm. he asked uh, Ted for some help. Ted helped him, never got paid. Jeez. So I, Ted wrote the forward to my book, mm-hmm. or, or one of the forwards. What happened was I asked him to write a forward. He wrote such a short forward. It's really short, yeah. <laughs> I, I went to, to uh, Chris Culler, who wrote the second one. Mm-hmm. But then so much time passed between when they first wrote it, because this book's been, I've been working on this book forever. I asked them if they want to revise what they wrote. So Ted sent me this big, big attack on Nolan Bushnell. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't include that. Oh, man. That can be one of the uh, Kickstarter bonuses for the next edition. I do have a no Bushnell, Bushnell story, attack letter. You, know, if you want to hear that one? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Um, I was actually just going to ask you. I mean, what 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 do you really think of Nolan Bushnell? Like, well, I met him like three times, and in person, he's a great guy. It's when 
you're not in person, uh, that <laughs> he'll stab you in the back. And I, I asked him if he'd write the full, you know, a co-forward to the book because I thought it'd be pretty cool if I had Ted and Nolan writing the forward. Yeah, and that would have been awesome. Responded. He never responded. And I heard, I think from Kurt, that he didn't want to talk to me because he called me a Ralph Bear fanboy. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. Well, anyway, after Ralph got his uh, award from President Bush, mm-hmm. he, uh, I think the IEEE did a, an article about him in a magazine. So uh, Bush now got hold of this story. And then he wrote an email to Ralph, which I have somewhere, and I just can't find it, saying that Ralph stole his lab notes. <laughs> and uh, apparently uh, Nolan's saying he invented he invented video games and Ralph, Ralph stole his, his lab notebook, which nobody ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> so was a, I, I've definitely heard some... Uh, conflicting reports on like whether or not he saw like was it space war or something or well, that's a that's a contention i mean in my book i say he did and someone complained to me well that's not true but we really don't know he had to see it somewhere mm-hmm. but he might have seen it. so until you know the facts are conclusive i don't know what to tell you because the book does say my book says he saw it at the University of Utah. Mm-hmm. But then there's proof that they didn't even have a, the computer there. <laughs> the book's not perfect, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any book it will ever be. No, and that's actually something pretty interesting. That's it's always been really interesting to me is that this um this industry isn't that old as far as like entertainment industries go. And there's 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 still things out there that are really difficult to pin down as far as you know, what, what exactly happened and what were the stories behind all these different things? Like, I mean, there was a recent controversy about what is nobody really knows. We're 100% certain what day Super Mario Brothers came out in America. Right. That's like, the one that Frank Cifaldi, I think, uh, uncovered or something. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really, it, even when, um, it hasn't really come up that much lately, but it always really fascinated me when I was a bit younger, when new Atari games kept popping up, not like homebrew is like mm-hmm. some old program. Just be like, oh, well, here's this uh, code I was working on back in the 70s. Yeah, just throw it <laughs> on the internet. Enjoy. It's <laughs> little things like that popping up are, are they're just so fascinating to me that that's. Well, it kind of like it, <clears throat> it goes back to how I, the industry was thought of as like a kid's toy back in the day. Cause I mean, I grew up in the 80s. I was a big He-Man fan, and I- I'm pretty damn sure, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty damn sure that there there isn't a record of what day Skeletor first released. You know what I mean? Like, Because people just didn't care or didn't think that it was going to be anything that they should care about. Mm. So, you know. Kind of like all those Doctor Who episodes that just got deleted. Cause, right. one, one thing about Ralph, Ralph was a meticulous uh, note taker. So all his lab notes are intact, and I think uh, they're in Smithsonian now. But not everybody was like that. Yeah, there was uh, definitely a lot of uh, – and, and especially trying to get – this This one of the things I read in your forward about the new version of Phoenix that I'm really interested to get to is uh, all the stuff about um, – you said that there's a lot more focus on stuff that was happening in Japan. Yeah. And that's that stuff's really fascinating to me too because there was these – Oh, there were these books about the history of Nintendo by oh, they were Pix and Love Publishing. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Oh, they just all these crazy pictures of all the toys and stuff they used to make. Oh, those books were so fascinating to me. And I, I you're lo- trying to look up any of this stuff. I, I don't know. It's really hard to find uh information on, on that kind of stuff through any re- really traditional means. I mean, at, growing up, I was just I started on Atari and uh, Atari just kind of lit the imagination. And then once Nintendo hit, that's just really took me off mm-hmm. way even further. And so I've been a humongous N- Nintendo fan for as long as I can remember. And when I, every time I would learn things about how much more history there is to that company in Japan, it always fascinated me, but there was never really a really good way for me to learn more about that history, uh, at least within my means. Like I couldn't just, 
go to Japan and learn about this stuff. Right. Uh, I remember there was a, a great, um, uh, the Super Mario World Player's Guide it was called Mario uh Mario Mania, and it was half of it was a history of Super Mario Brothers, and it was the first time I had ever seen uh, uh, Miyamoto's original drawings of when he was trying to put Yoshi in the original Super Mario Brothers, and the first time I learned about Doki Doki Panic, and and I used to carry that thing to me with to, to school with me, and any pieces of game history like that were just just incredible to me. So obviously when I finally get my hands on a book like Phoenix, where it's like, and here is excruciating detail about the whole industry uh, really just, just kind of lights the world on fire for me. Uh, fire Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, so, I mean, I think, I, I think that leads into a good question. What is, um what is your research process like? Because so much of this stuff is so hard to track down. <sighs> Uh, that's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> I really don't know how to answer that because a lot of the stuff I found totally by accident. <laughs> that's fair. I mean, that yeah, one thing honest. and also come across something else and then start digging into that, come across something else, especially with the Japanese stuff and also the, uh, the European stuff mm. that's in there. I had no clue what the first, uh, I thought the television was the first console to have uh, overlays for its controllers, but it wasn't. <laughs> what was? It's the, uh, I don't want to say what it's in the book, but uh, I would have to look it up. <laughs> it, it's, a European, it's a European system. Wow. There's, there's a picture of the overlays in the book. I, that is, uh, I love that there's all these pictures in there. It's it's distracting to me because I'll start reading and I'll see a picture and I'm like, what picture's on the next page? And I'll just start <laughs> flipping through the page. Look the color pictures. version will be nicer, even nicer when that one comes out. Oh uh, yeah, I'll, when is that one? Uh, when is that? I don't one? know because the laws. I guess that there's some errors we've uncovered. I want to fix those for. Mm -hmm. I can't fix it for the black and white one, so I, I will be putting an, an errata on my website, my mm -hmm. web page. So people who buy the black and white one will know what's been changed. But I want to fix these errors that come out before into the color one. Mm -hmm. Hopefully soon. <laughs> well, I think that's a pretty decent enough uh, a decent enough breaking point. So we're gonna we're gonna take ourselves a quick breather, and when we come back, we're gonna ask uh, more questions uh, for Leonard Herman. So uh, you're listening to the Stone Age Gamer Podcast from Geekade.com. So stick around. And now, here's a look at some of the other original content available right now at Geekade.com. First up... <laughs> no, really, it's the first time. Football is quickly becoming one of the more controversial sports out there. Now that there's some high-profile protests going on, the sport is neck-deep in unusual attention. How do these things affect teams and the league as a whole? Check out Matt Sizemore's latest article take a stand for our country located in the think tank next b cosplay's latest video is by far their most comprehensive yet in fact you would be hard pressed to find a more comprehensive video on the topic what topic is that Why? what topic is it dan it's building cosplay armor of course chris check oh, out b goodness. cosplays in the workshop from concept to completion it's comprehensive ladies and gentlemen Yes. Then, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> then. I, I just assume you're talking to me when you say ladies I and am. gentlemen. So I feel pretty. The next president of the United States uh, is uh, also a member of the WWE Hall of Fame. But Dan Ryan thinks that maybe we as a nation chose the wrong Hall of Famer for the job. Check out his list of other inductees who would make potentially better presidents than the one we wound up with in Why I Love Wrestling, Catharsis. I, I think you should maybe strike the word potentially from the record, but that's just me. I feel I feel like every time I start talking about it, I, I need like, I need a chew toy. So I just- Every, <laughs> every morning is pure potential, Dan. 
<laughs> every is. morning is potential. Uh, finally. Hey, what's up with that? <laughs> Black Mirror is a very interesting show, and Chip Garrison is here to prove that point to you. With the current state of the country being as it is after this volatile election, there might not be a better time than now to watch a show like this one. Give a read to Black Mirror. The revolution will be digitized. You can catch all this great stuff plus tons of other articles, videos, podcasts, and more right now at geekade.com. Welcome back, everybody. We're still here with uh, with Leonard Herman, uh, author of Phoenix Four, and um, let's see if we can recreate that. Lenny, did you have a question for me? Are you wow, that was smooth that? as fucking silk. <laughs> what about the Clico Expo? Why, yes, I did hear about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So apparently, there's a Coleco Expo coming up. I. This is the first one that they've done, right? I've never heard of this before. Yeah, well, Chris Cardillo, who owns Co- the Coleco name, he announced it yesterday, I think. Wow. Um, I, I didn't. I couldn't really find a whole ton of information on it on the site. Uh, do you know any more about this? Yeah, I, I know what you know. He just says it's going to be in Edison, I think, August 6th and 7th. Wow. That's exciting. I, I, I saw immediately, like, one of the first comments on the Facebook post was somebody asking if the Coleco Chameleon was going to be there. <laughs> oh, I can see that. <laughs> if it's not there, I am going to be very, very disappointed. Whoever I runs their Facebook page has such a good sense of humor because uh, they took it in stride. Like, they're like, no, what other surprises are going to be there? And I have, uh, I was not much of a Coleco guy growing up. I didn't know even know anybody with a Coleco vision. I didn't get one until um, I was working at Funko Land in my teens. Um, but uh, I do have a tremendous amount of respect for that console. It's 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 pretty interesting, and um, I'm I was really proud of Coleco for handling the Chameleon situation the way that they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was. That was something. We 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 did a couple episodes on the Coleco Coleco Chameleon. I, I asked Mike Kennedy if he could send me a picture of it because I do mention it in the book because it is history. Wow. He never Can't... responded. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, I may actually die of shock. <laughs> that was a uh, boy. I. But I did go to Toy Fair earlier this year. Oh, did you? You saw the? Yeah, I was there. Wow. That's the only there. reason I went there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that the person is... I feel bad for is one of the marketing guys. His name is Ben Herman. Mm-hmm. And I call him my Uncle Ben. <laughs> he used to be the uh, American president of. Uh, he used to be the president of uh, SNK America. Oh boy! And so I once went to him for a job, and I did have an Uncle Benny. So who? I did have an Uncle Benny Herman, so I, I jokingly call him my uncle. <laughs> so it's funny. Last week, he congratulated me for the new book, and he goes, is my name in there? So I said, uh, your last name's in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But he got mixed in with the with the chameleon. That was a poor guy. What a, what a shit show. Oh. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> and I really, I, I really enjoyed the retro... VG, uh, magazine that mm-hmm. they uh, launched like i kickstarted that thing and yeah i did too but i was i was supposed to be one of the uh, writers for it and then i just got knocked out huh well that's lame <laughs> <laughs> i've uh, i've i've been fortunate enough to to be able to write for nintendo force magazine which is a fantastic magazine that gets my my highest recommendation <laughs> uh, but anyway i digress uh i I was going to say, I've been fortunate enough to write for Geek Aid, and that's it. Somebody, <laughs> somebody pay me money. I'm funny. Damn it, I write interesting articles. Uh, I'll pay you in hugs. Oh, um, the best kind of payment. Can you really put a price on love? <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see. Well, uh, quick you know, quick technical, technical question. question. Um, is, there, is there an ebook version in the works for Phoenix? Because uh, 
I have a I have an uh, an infant who insists on being carried a lot, and I would love to be reading your book while I'm doing it, but I can't really manage it with one hand because it's. I, I, I will be looking into it, that, but the problem, from what I see, uh, first of all, the size of the book and the number of photos there's a th over a thousand photos might make the file just too big. Hmm. And that's one thing I have to look into because one of the original publishers I had told me that. So I don't know. And Amazon, who did print the book, they do do uh, ebooks, but they don't take it from a PDF. PDF is all nice and formatted. They want to take it from Word files. And my Word files aren't set up for that. I don't have any images in the Word file. So it means I have to really start from scratch. Yikes. And, yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't <want> <laughs> this that. word is so fun to work with. <laughs> But I want to get the color one out, and then I'll look into an ebook. That's excellent. Let's uh, speak. Speaking of uh, uh, of books, what other game history books do you like or recommend uh, for for somebody who reads to read after Phoenix or even before reading Phoenix? Well, I look. I like the uh, Console Wars by by Blake Harris. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another. There's a Nintendo book that gets uh, overlooked called. Super Mario by Jeff Ryan. I thought that was a great book. Oh, well, actually, I have that. I haven't even opened it yet. I got it for Christmas like a it's year or two very, ago. Very, very good. Huh. It's very good. I'm probably going to give up on uh, on Tristan Donovan's book and start reading that <laughs> after I finish Phoenix. Because <laughs> that's why I got those both the same year, and I decided to attack Replay first, and I think that's been my holding pattern since, so... So what you're saying is that we will not be interviewing Tristan Donovan in the future? <laughs> fair enough. I think it's a Jeff, fair Jeff Ryan is local. Jeff Ryan's a Jersey guy, too? Yeah, he's in Bluefield. All right. Let's get him on the show. Sweet. <laughs> no, but he, he I, I really enjoyed his book. Uh, and like I said, Console Wars, I really enjoyed that. That was like more, that was like reading a novel. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's on my list. I haven't is and that in paperback Blake, yet? Blake was kind enough to write a blurb for the back cover also. Oh, nice. Uh, I'm getting Michael Thomason's book about weird games. That like, sounds fun. I haven't heard of that one. It just came out. It came out this week. Huh. Uh, that, you can get that from www.gooddealgames.com. Cool. I got to put a plug in for Michael. He did my cover. Oh, nice. <laughs> it, is a, it is a cool cover. I'm... I, I, I rather like it. It makes the book seem very action packed. <laughs> <laughs> everything, um, like everything you've published, you're you're pretty much self publishing, right? Is, am, or am I wrong there? No, no, you're right. Uh, what's that like? Like, what's that process like? Because that that what you're doing is daunting enough. Like chronicling the history of a very um, complex, just poorly poorly recorded industry mm -hmm. is already a pretty daunting task to then self publish on top of that. Well, is... well Amazon makes it easy with their create space where they okay. print on demand and the, the book came out really nice. They don't do color though. That's the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, they do color up to 400 pages. So that leaves me out, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I wanted a publisher because for distribution purposes, uh, and I had a publisher for this book. I had a contract signed, but they wanted the book to go in a different direction than it was going. And I wasn't willing to have a different book. So uh, we parted ways earlier this year, uh, early last year, I think. Mm -hmm. And I talked to two other publishers. One, uh, we talked. And it went, the book went through a peer review of six people. Three said, go with it. Other three said, no, we don't need it. And uh, then at that point, that's when I decided to self-publish it. So the person I was working with, she said, do you want to proceed? I said, no, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm going to do it myself. But then after that, if someone said, uh, try one more publisher. Uh, and this other publisher was interested. They wanted the book. But the problem is, are you familiar with uh, Brett Weiss's books? No, uh, I can't. The say name that sounds familiar. Classic video game series. Um, 
I, the name really does sound okay. Familiar. Well, he has a series of books covering a different era in video games, mm -hmm. and they start as hardcover books and really, really made well. Nice looking books, but the 250 page black and white book was going for uh, $55. So I can yeah, just imagine what an 800 page book is going to go for. That's a big ask. That's yeah. So they were going to charge if, if I went with this publisher, they would charge a lot of money for the book. The royalties would be low. So I said, no, I'm just going to do it myself. So they wanted me to sign a contract, but then they were also worrying about uh, rights to the photos and stuff. So I said, not forget. I'm just, I'm going to do it myself. Mm. So that's where we are. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Crazy. I mean, like it's it, it's a Go very ahead. punk rock thing. Oh, to do. these it's books! A... Yes, I know what books you're talking about. Now, these have been on my Amazon Amazon wish list for like five years. <laughs> well, see, Chris, you got to share that publicly so that fans of the show will buy you presents every now and again. That's what I do. I wrote the forward for the third but... one. Really? Yeah, I've I was I remember finding these just on a random search on uh, on Amazon before and looking at. Just the covers in general, being like, "Wow, these look really snazzy." What are what are, what are these books actually like on the inside? Like, well, they're summaries. Uh, well, he, I don't know if you're familiar with my book, ABC to VCS. That was the first book I was going to write, and I finally did publish it. And I, yeah, I haven't read it. Okay, well, my book is again, it's summaries of, of just about every 2600 game up to, I guess, the year 2005 when it came out. Well, Brett's book is a similar thing for a bunch of systems from a certain era. Like, I don't know what hand. I don't want to say the wrong thing. Uh, but I can just take the book out and look at it. Like, volume one is the years 1972 to 1984. Mm -hmm. And what he does is list every American game for each of these systems. And not only does he give a summary, but sometimes he tell um, his opinion of the games, too. Like a, a little review, but he. Oh covered. wow! So this, I mean, this almost seems like a really, a really expanded version of something like the old digital press guides. Yeah, more or less. Wow. Uh, the books are now available. All three editions are now available in uh, paperback, so that's a lot cheaper. I'm seeing that. Yeah. Uh huh. And Brett's a good friend, so of course I want to push his books. <laughs> Well, well, well. All right. Well, they're going definitely on my Christmas list this year. With the... another book he has is uh, we're supposed to be talking about my book, but <laughs> <laughs> he has the hundred greatest console video games. Oh, that's him too, huh? That's I've actually too. seen this one. And that's a oh, full the... color uh, hardcover book. The things you learn. I really want to get that Art of Atari book. That's like top on my list because I love Atari art. So so much. I had to decide if I'm gonna get the the deluxe one or the regular one. I'm in the same boat. I got the deluxe I'm, one looks so cool. It does it look so cool? <laughs> but I'm so like. But it's seventy five dollars. I know it's, that's a lot of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I, I'll use that as a kind of a kind of a segue since we're we're talking a little bit about games. What what games do you like to play? Do you play modern games? Do you? Uh, I'm, <sighs> I don't have time. I still, I still love my Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Nice. And I can't wait for the portable flashback to come out. That does look very, very cool. I don't like the looks of it, but <laughs> like I think, did I see? I can't I don't even remember what I saw now. I feel like somebody had their hands on one and it was well, playing. It looks like the Sega portable that yeah that Act Games put out. It's the same uh, design. The Act Games, uh, the Atari flashbacks, always kind of rubbed me the wrong way because a lot of the games. Like they weren't the twenty six hundred games, or they were weird ports of something, and like I, I grew up. There wasn't a Space Invaders in the arcade when I grew up, so oh. Space Invaders for me is the Atari twenty six hundred Space Invaders, right. and that wasn't the version that was on the flashbacks. And I saw a video of somebody, somebody posted like, "Oh, I can finally play the twenty six hundred version on the go," and I didn't, you know, click through it to, to read. Well, the flashback takes the SD card, so you, you, as long as you have the ROMs, it's going to play oh. those games. Oh, that is delightful. <laughs> I think it's supposed to come out uh, next week. Wow. As we talk. As, we, as people listen to this. 
they will be they will know <laughs> that this thing is out there and they can load their Atari ROMs into it. I want to get the NES uh, Classic too. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't mind having one of those, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm not willing to pay a thousand dollars for it. Ugh, no, that's just obscene. Nor should you be. <laughs> Nor should you be. Um, is, a, yeah. is there anything else that you're working on currently? I mean, I know you said like the color version of the book, um, which is awesome. I mean, putting all those photos and just getting, just having that that package all together like that. But is there anything? No, nothing. That you're nothing on afterwards. Anything taking a break I'm working on this book for 10 years now well why stop now i mean <laughs> really it's uh, uh, if you if you have a copy of ralph bear's book which came out in 2005 on the last page it says coming soon phoenix four <laughs> <laughs> that's fabulous that's awesome that uh, you had mentioned your your Atari book. Um, I, I'm a, have you ever heard? Uh, this is just a complete segue. Have you ever listened to um, the Atari Twenty Six Hundred Game by Game podcast? No. That's uh, <laughs> I think you might actually find that rather fascinating. There's um, a guy named Robert Ferguson. He's been on our show oh, before. I know Rob. Oh, you do? We go back years. Really? You never yeah. listened to a show? No. Oh, it's so <laughs> I mean, good. We go back to, to Nava back in when it was in. Uh... Howell, New Jersey. Oh wow! Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of Ferg. Like I I found out about his podcast. That's that's how I know him. And he was on our show before. And his podcast is fascinating because he just he just goes game by game through the whole library. Uh, I have, to, I have to take a look. I just haven't had time to do anything. <laughs> I understand that feeling. Huh. All right. Well, uh, let's see. The only questions I have left are ridiculous questions. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll start with the with with the basic ridiculous questions. Uh, uh, what is your favorite color? <laughs> it's ridiculous. I guess blue. That's a solid answer. That would have. That's <laughs> also. That's a little figure on the screen. It's a blue. You know, a blue guy. I it it, it matches. It suits you. <laughs> you look good in blue. If I said pink, what would you say? Uh, well, um, I, I'm not a huge fan of pink. <laughs> uh, Princess Peach never really liked her very much. But uh, to each their own. You know. Look, we're, we're hopeless hacks. We would have said you look good in pink. I'll be honest <laughs> with you, Lenny. I'm not trying to bullshit you here, sir. <laughs> uh, all right, now this is this is something that I've asked uh, asked a lot of people. Uh, what bread is the best bread? I would say <laughs> bread. I don't even know if it's still around, but I don't eat bread, so <laughs> really, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, borderline diabetic, so I got to stay away this, from starches and stuff. Huh. Well, all right then. Well, Wonder Bread is a respectable answer. I believe. Uh, I believe Ferg said Shala Bread. Of course, he's a baker, so yeah. Of course, Hala. he would say something fancy like that. Wait. It's hala bread. Are you talking about hala? Not chala. I have. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Chris, oh, we hala. live in New Jersey. It's <laughs> hala bread with a h in it. That's correct. Yeah. <sighs> Fucking South Jersey kids. I'll tell you what. I live in South Jersey now, but I. Oh, anyway, well, it's not a Jersey thing. <laughs> it's a Jewish thing. Well, I know, but the, the, the Jewish population of New Jersey is far more centered in North Jersey than Southern Jersey, at least in my experience living uh, in Southern wood. Jersey now. Well, that, uh, well, okay, that's fair. <laughs> this podcast is taking a turn very quickly. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> taking a turn. <laughs> well, I mean, I think uh, uh, this is just as usually about the amount of time we would spend uh, before we wrap things up. Uh, is there anything else you want to plug or say before you go? I know you well, mentioned uh, something about a discount code or something. Yeah, you to uh, if anyone wants to buy my book from my website, www.rolentapress.com. That's R-O-L-E-N-T-A-P-R-E-S-S.com. I'm offering a 20% discount of Phoenix 4, or actually your whole order. You can also get Ralph Bear's book. Uh, by entering the promo code P H E I V V four, 
P-H-E-I-V, and that'll be throughout the end of the year. And to really entice people, whoever orders it from my website, Phoenix, gets it autographed. Uh-huh. That'll get people running to Amazon. That, that's right. I'm there right now. <laughs> and if you buy it, you can read a sentence uh, written by me because I'm, I'm a pull quote on there. Well, I think it's in the two sentences. Uh, well, yeah, that's true. On the yeah. inside cover, you're in there with two sentences. I yes, yes, I am. Yes, you're serious. I'm joking aside. Like I brought this to my parents' house. I brought this to work. I showed up. <laughs> Look, guys, some people are buying it. Uh, well, I'm. I'm. Well, everyone listening, buy this book. I mean, buy my book. <laughs> buy my book. All right. Well, is there is there anything else uh, that you wanted to plug before we go? Uh, besides the uh, you you mentioned the uh, the the code. Uh, you already said there isn't anything else you're working on, but you said there's other books. Uh, the Ralph Bear's book is available through Relenta Press, right? Well it's, well, it's available through Amazon, which is comes to me anyway, and it's available through Relenta Press. Outstanding. All right. Well, um, that is our show. Uh, join us next week when finally we'll be starting our two-week experiment involving games we love, games we no longer love, and all that jazz. Uh, the the NPR experiment that we pushed off for a couple of weeks uh once again you can get in touch with us at mail at geekade.com as well as all flavors of social media that we inhabit you can like us on facebook find us on instagram at geekade subscribe to our youtube and twitch channels for our latest video content follow us on twitter at the underscore geekade you can also find us individually on twitter i'm at geekade chris that's geekade k-r-i-s and dan is at geekade dan if you're interested in more information about anything we discussed tonight, be sure to check out our show notes. And while you're at it, you can also subscribe to this and any of our other wonderful podcasts on iTunes or Stitcher. Or if you're super nice, you can leave us a review because any and all feedback is welcome and appreciated. We'd also like to thank our intrepid editor, Evan, for making our show listenable to all you folks. And we'd also like to thank Mark TDK Knight for our show's theme, which you can check out on uh, SoundCloud and Bandcamp or his website, which we have a link to in the show notes. And uh, one final time, thank you so much, Leonard Herman, for coming on the show. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have you. Oh, thanks for having me. It was fun. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, again, always remember to keep your eyes on geekade.com where we post something new every single day. On behalf of myself and Dan, keep playing games. Mm-hmm.